Oh, hi. Let's review the Logitech G Cloud. For this review, I wanted to answer some questions that I've had for some time now. Is game streaming any good yet? Is it worth having a device that only streams real games in 2022? Why would I want game streaming? It's probably a good one. Why would anybody want a game streaming device? Is this the future of Android tablets maybe? Let's do a quick rundown of the specs. Uh, CPU is middle of the road, last gen Snapdragon 720G. It's eight cores. Let's call it two performance cores and six efficiency cores, uh, kind of in the new lingo of things. The GPU is an Adreno 618. The RAM is four gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM. It's got 64 gigabytes of internal storage. It can handle an SD card up to one terabyte with an asterisk next to it that is, it can only handle file formats of FAT32. We'll get into that later. Uh, seven inch 1920 by 1080 IPS panel that goes up to 450 nits peak brightness. Although I did notice it gets kind of washed out toward the end of that range. It has Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 5.1. It's a 6,000 milliamp hour battery and it runs kind of a custom, custom boot version of Android 11. Let's run through the pros real quick. The build quality is fantastic. The ergonomics are great. The screen is pretty good. Uh, the Wi-Fi chip performance has been so good so far. Haptics are actually great uh, on par with the Steam Deck. Uh, emulation is actually really good, surprisingly, in a bunch of reviews that I've watched. And the battery life is fantastic. The cons, let's go over those. Price, way too expensive. Uh, the D-pad sucks, no, no diagonal inputs. The joysticks feel short, not as bad as a Joy-Con, but similar. No video out, no dock no way to play this similar to everything else in its price range. 64 gigabytes of internal storage is a downside. FAT32 is a downside. No key mapping software for Android games, downside, and uh, slower CPU. So the physical overall profile is almost as thick as a Steam Deck at its thickest part, much thinner at its thinnest part. Sturdy build quality makes it feel premium, yet it's light without feeling cheap. Feels really good in the hands. The thumbs don't reach the middle of the screen properly to use the touch screen in a normal game controller mode. The touch inputs are better than the Steam Deck because it's a normal Android phone basically I would imagine. Maybe a better digitizer but uh, you know it, it's fine. It's not good. It's not bad. It's fine. The power button is like a slide over. Not really a fan. It's kind of weird. It kind of annoyed me. I'd rather just have a normal button to push. Uh, I don't like that it sticks up and it's actually easier to knock than a, a, a sunken in one like the Steam Deck or Switch. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just a button. I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. When unlocking the device you have to hit any button on the controller, but then you have to take your hand off of the controller to reach the middle of the screen to put in your code to unlock it. Now, since this is an Android tablet, essentially, I used a code to lock it. I don't want anybody getting it if I leave it somewhere and getting my info or buying stuff. Super annoying to unlock. Really small nitpick here, but kind of annoying. It could have done better. The buttons don't seem to work for, on the, the buttons on the controller and the D-pad don't seem to work for unlocking or, or selecting the numbers. It's incredibly thin, lightweight, and that makes sense since it's just just the tablet. It doesn't got anywhere near the amount of hardware and cooling in it needed to be thick and heavy like a Steam Deck or something else that plays all of that hardware. So that makes sense as well. Uh, the face buttons are all good. XYAB, great, they're fine. People who are really into, you know, old school emulation might not like them as much, but I think they're actually a fantastic implementation. D-pad leaves something to be wanted. And the start and select buttons don't feel like much of anything. They're weird and shallow, but very clicky. So most people find that satisfying. There's little raised bumps on the start and select button so you can find them easily. I guess in the dark since there's no lights on any of the buttons They're pretty good charging port and headphone jack are at the bottom Which I can't stand uh, the Steam Deck's the only one to get this right since this doesn't have to dock Does no need for the, the type C to be at the bottom like the switch where it's gonna slide into a dock I play laying down a lot and I set the entire uh, PC down So if I have to play something like the Steam Deck and charge it at the same time There's no cable in the way the joystick placement is such that in the way that I hold it for actual gaming My thumbs end up covering uh, corners of the screen at times. The card slot for micro SD, it's good, uh, it's fine. Uh, it's at the bottom, normal. It's got a cover, unlike the Steam Deck where it's just exposed, it's got a cover which is nice for dust or whatever other elements can get in there. The display is not amazing, it's good, better than most handhelds, but compared to any Android phone or Switch OLED, it's fine. It's, it's a good overall screen. It's not as awesome and amazing as all the other reviewers are touting it to be, but it's a good screen. All in all, the whole package is pretty nice. Um, I like it, it's ergonomic, feels good in the hand, and it's 
nice, but still not as good as a Steam Deck ergonomics. Um, there's something about the way that feels and your, your, all your fingers can wrap around it real good uh, that's just better to me, uh, which is okay because it's lighter and it's smaller, so it doesn't need to be as good. Uh, you're not gonna get that same hand fatigue. That makes the difference. There is a key mapping in the settings that's very robust for key, changing the key layout of the actual built-in controller, but there's no key mapping software for games. So this means there are many Android games you just can't play with the controller. And the bummer about that is because of the outside controllers being so big, it's really hard for you to play them with your thumbs because of the size of the controllers separating your hands too far away from the screen like you would on a phone. So it's fine, controller's good and, and, and I really enjoy it, but that is kind of a bummer. Let's get into the software. The setup is as easy as signing into Android on a tablet or a phone. Log in to your Google account and you are brought to a screen that will ask you if you want tablet mode or handheld mode with gamers go here next to the handheld mode. This is where you choose your experience. I'm gonna skip the tablet mode for now as this is a gaming device. You can switch to the tablet mode at any time in the setting though. All right, let's talk about Android gaming. The gaming mode is a stripped down sort of a console-like experience. I think it's well polished and works fine. It's basically a game launcher like you would find for any other Android launcher that you've used before. Very similar to that. Looks kind of reminiscent of the Switch in style. This is, however, an Android device, meaning you can run any launcher you want, so you are not limited to that. Like I mentioned before, you can always go into the settings and change it to tablet mode at any time. Tablet mode will work much better for most people uh, as all the glory of Android is there all the swipe gestures and, and touch controls and kind of all the stuff that's missing from the stripped down uh, handheld mode. I also had trouble with the video streaming services uh, working properly. Both touch and controller inputs seem to hit or miss. Some, some things work, some things don't. Why even have a device like this if you aren't gonna use it for YouTube uh, and Netflix too? For $350, this would have to be a gaming handheld and a competent video consumption device for me. The price is just too high for gaming alone. The performance of Android gaming is pretty good. Uh, the settings seem to be a little bit lower than I would like for the size and resolution of this screen, but they play fantastic. Here's Diablo Immortal playing at a perfect 60 frames per second, it looks like, and it looks beautiful. All right, let's talk about cloud streaming. Tried xCloud first. Uh, this worked and played exactly like it did in my review of the Backbone 1 controller a few months back for my iPhone. It's game streaming. xCloud is still technically in beta, so I shouldn't be too harsh on it. This still has way too much input latency to really be an enjoyable experience. I don't see it getting any better. It's fine for a really casual game, but when I can push a button on a controller and remove my finger and then see the character jump after I've removed my finger. That's just way too much. I played Forza Horizon 5, which is awesome, by the way. You should definitely play that if you have an Xbox or, or a PC. And the latency when turning was more than enough to make steering a giant pain. It wasn't horrible, but if you're used to playing on a console, like you're not gonna have a fun time. Playing a shooter also left me wanting more. I, I just am not a fan of game streaming from the cloud yet. It worked as well as it can be expected and was perfectly fine. I don't think anybody would notice any major issues with it. The latency is what you expect from Xbox, xCloud Gaming. There was a lot of banding, artifacting, a lot of internet cloud streaming, you know, stuff. It's just it's just a fact of life if you're gonna be using game streaming. It may have even been all the way down to 720p. I'm not 100% sure. The games looked basically blurry the whole time, which was really not how I like to enjoy my games. I like high fidelity. Even if it's at 720p, I'd rather it be native on something like the Steam Deck with sharp edges and no softness and no uh, visible artifacting, but you know. <laughs> I have great internet, so your mileage may vary, um, and you know, you'll have to test it yourself. Uh, NVIDIA GeForce Now Streaming had a much better experience playing this. It was significantly better with latency and graphics. The overall system is better and was awesome. I was actually blown away, and this was much more similar to in-home game streaming, which we'll get into next on my local network. NVIDIA is doing great things with latency and input lag and all those things. Uh, it really was a truly good experience, and it looked way better than xCloud. Next, we'll get into local streaming or in-home streaming of your own local devices, starting out with PS5 Remote Play. The PS5 Remote Play app has support for a PS5 or a PS4 controller, respectively but only for those. So in order to do that, I would have to get a stand and set this up on something and go get a controller and be able to play. If I'm doing all of that, I'm just gonna play the PS5 natively and I'm not gonna play this in another room. Had to actually purchase an app on the Android store with support for any controller called PS Play. It's by Florian Grill. This app made the process just as simple and easy as the PS Remote Play app. The streaming worked great, uh, just like the PS Remote Play app, but I was able to use the controller built into the Logitech G Cloud. Now you can see the input latency here 
here in this clip, while it is noticeable in a video game, it didn't feel bad like the, the cloud streaming. It was actually quite playable and a wonderful experience, much better than the cloud streaming apps for sure. And I would rate this as a super good device for streaming PS5 or PS4 in home. Even with the Wi-Fi 5 chip, it's a very powerful one or a high quality one, or there's optimization on Logitech's part. And I had no issues streaming in home. That app is a good one too. Check it out. Florian, you did a great job. Appreciate you, brother. The app was $5.99 also. On to Steam Link or Steam in-home PC streaming. This also was a pleasant surprise, a theme throughout this. Everything's mostly been a pleasant surprise to use. I found myself playing Gotham Knights for a couple of hours on the couch one morning. A little bit of extra latency made me a little less accurate on the bat cycle, but other than that, it was a truly playable experience. Now, just for testing sake, I played the same games streaming Steam and PS5 on my Steam Deck and did notice that on the Steam streaming, it was a little bit better. The latency was a tiny bit better. The perceived input lag was just barely noticeable better. I can confidently report that this device lives up to its description and is a game streaming beast in home locally. As far as emulation goes, I watched the review of Retro Game Corpse, which is my favorite retro emulation channel. Uh, he's fantastic. Go check out the channel. He's an amazing dude. He deserves all the support and all the fans in the world. And his video is super in depth. Anyway, as far as the D-pad goes, there's no diagonal inputs, which will suck for all fighting games you may want to emulate, as well as any new fighting games with the need for rolling inputs. The SD card is limited to FAT32, which means you cannot transfer or copy any files over four gigabytes in size to the SD card. This isn't the machine I would use for bigger or newer emulation either way, but will limit your game file sizes, and it's just kind of a bummer this day and age. A one terabyte drive, you should be able to be SDXC and format to any size you want, uh, bigger sizes than four gigs for sure. This runs Dreamcast and 8-bit and 16-bit emulators all the way up to GameCube, PS1, or even some PS2 games, but the size of those games will be over four gigabytes and the FAT32 storage format on the SD card means you really can't play those games or any system bigger or newer than that. Seriously, check out the Retro Game Corpse video. His review is incredible. He does a super deep dive and we'll let you know everything that plays on emulation. Now, since this is a game streaming focused handheld, you can always emulate the big consoles like PS3 or Switch or anything like that from your gaming PC or home rig and stream those locally to the G Cloud and be able to emulate anything that way through Moonlight or Parsec streaming. I'm gonna be honest, I really wanted to hate this. It's got lackluster specs, it can't be docked, it has no video output from the Type-C, it's super expensive, it's FAT32, it runs Android, but in a vacuum, this is a really cool device. I actually thought its performance was great and the build quality was nothing less than stellar with Logitech's first handheld being something of total polish and an all round great user experience. I think for most people, the game mode is not gonna be good enough. The touch gestures are missing and streaming video apps don't work right with the joysticks and buttons on the controller. So that will need to be updated. This is a capable Android device that can confidently run most emulation up to PS1 PSP, GameCube, but not much higher than that due to its middle of the road Snapdragon processor. It runs Android games well, but at lower settings for the same reason. Game streaming is still not there for me in a device that is actually quite playable if you have good internet, but that's gonna totally depend on location of more factors. I have a Wi-Fi 6 band in my house that is specifically for my gaming devices, and I have a beast router for gaming. So your mileage may vary and you may not get the same results as I'm reporting. But unfortunately, for the G Cloud, it is not in a vacuum, not even close. There are so many devices that outperform this for nearly the same price that it's not even fair. At this price point of $350, you can get a Switch OLED, which runs circles around this for gaming, support, performance, screen, game catalog of first party titles, but the Switch can't be configured to run any emulator you want. However, the Switch does have first party emulators on the Nintendo Online, I believe it's a monthly service, and all of the old Nintendo systems are on there. It can be docked and played on a TV wirelessly with controllers, so it does all that. The Steam Deck, second comes in $50 higher at $399, has the same 64 gigabytes of storage and it's more powerful. It can emulate almost any system known to man. It can stream games better from Steam, PS5, better in, in my testing with slightly lower
lower perceived latency and lag. It is a full console capable of AAA titles locally and a backlog of at least 5,000 Steam games that are verified. That's not even counting games that haven't been verified yet and still play great on the Steam Deck. It's more comfortable to hold in the hand and it's got a brighter future, especially for tinkering and emulation because it runs Linux. It can be docked and played on a TV. It can be used as a full computer replacement. It is incredible. And last but not least of the three that I'm gonna mention, the Ion Odin comes in in two models, one at 199 and one at 299, I believe, and it has better performance, but it's a little less ergonomic and it's not comfortable to hold. It is not readily available and does not have the support of a massive company like Logitech behind it for support and warranty. So there's that also, but it can be docked. It can be played with wireless controllers. It does have video output and can handle files over four gigabytes. So in conclusion, who is this device for? It's a really hard question to answer. The reality of a device like this is that it's more of a companion than a main device to me. I am the outlier, a tech and gaming YouTuber who buys all the things as my hobby and to make videos and play with all the tech. I built this channel on the idea that everything I would review or test was through the lens of it being the only device I could afford to buy if I had that money. And is it worth it for that price? For the G Cloud, I see this as a device to accompany your gaming PC laptop, Xbox, or PS5. I can't imagine spending $350 for a device that is nice, but this limited in how you can play games. I agree with all other reviewers that the device is just too expensive. It really is at this price point. The screen is beautiful and the build is awesome. The polish is what I expect from Logitech and the screen is good enough for watching YouTube videos and movies. All in all, it's a great experience, but it's too expensive. I think $299 would have been too high of a price also. I think this device is really for only two types of people. Number one is the type of person who has extra money to spend and just wants a cool, capable emulator for older games and wants to stream their console or PC in the home. If the price doesn't bother you, then go for it. It's a great device for you. I think number two, the person who is looking for a great Android tablet and is also a gamer. If I think of this as a game streaming device and also an Android tablet, then I can get behind paying that price. For anyone else, buy a Steam Deck, a Switch, or just a Backbone controller for $99 for your iPhone or Android. If you're not one of those two people, I don't think this is the right handheld for you. This is being marketed by Logitech and, and Microsoft as a game streaming device. And I think that the majority of the people, as long as that's the marketing, are gonna be regular everyday gamers. They're not gonna be the tinkerers because Logitech can't just come out and say, hey, this is a great handheld emulation device. Only YouTubers like myself and Retro Game Corps and Taki Udon and these other guys are going to be the ones who say that. So I think that the way that this is being marketed is going to be a little bit of a letdown or the average person who gets this is going to use it exactly the way it came only for game streaming. I don't think that if you're only going to be game streaming and you're not going to be emulating at all, that this device is worth $350. If this was the only device that I could buy with the $350 that I saved up for one device, one and only one gaming device, this is not the one. I would not buy this device personally. This device is incredible in a vacuum and it's a fantastic purchase if it fits your use case, but it's not in a vacuum. And between $199 and $399, the market is stacked with other devices that can play things locally, store games on them, have backlogs of catalogs and emulate better than this one. It's the second most comfortable handheld I know of and the ergonomics are great, the screen is great, but for 50 more dollars, you can get a Steam Deck and then you can do everything. So all in all, let me know in the comments if you would buy this. What do you think of game streaming and is game streaming even good enough yet? As always, thank you so very much for watching this channel. I appreciate you and your support. Thank you so much. See you in the comments. Peace.